and lead us not into temptation. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me, the door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you for that reading. Let's just pray for a moment. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the challenge it brings and the encouragement it brings. Lord, guide us now as we reflect upon it in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if during the sermon we could have some of those words up. I'll, I'll say when, but if that's okay, we just go through the reading again. We're going to have a look at that reading in a moment or two. But first of all, I don't know when you've ever experienced really gener generous hospitality really generous hospitality now sometimes you can come in the most unusual places so a few years ago a group of us from my last church were visiting Malawi and we went to the local church the service was three and a half hours just to give you a sort of clue and it, and it was great celebration it was a mixture between African drumming and between sort of high Anglican and we had a baptism we welcomed new people it was great fun and we had singing of all different sorts it was wonderful service and afterwards there were 15 of us in our group the vicar invited us round to his house come to my house I've got to show you hospitality and he'd brought a crate of Fanta and Coke because this is what people from England drink <laughs> how much it cost I wouldn't like to say this is a very very poor situation village and the priest gets no money from the diocese gets no regular income has to find his own income and he bought us a crate of Fanta and Coke because that is what people from this country drink. So we all drank Fanta and Coke and had a lovely conversation. And I'm still in contact with Father Dyson. He Facebook's a wonderful thing, so I get about three messages a week, which is wonderful. On another occasion, when I, my previous job, I used to work for the leprosy mission and visited Chad, and we were going around visiting these villages. We went to one village, and I was traveling with um, a Dutch doctor and his wife, a Dutch physiotherapist, and a German nurse. We were all white, went to the village, we were allowed to sit and eat this enormous food, and the, 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 fem the white females were treated as men, so we all sat together and ate, and the women and children sat outside, and we had this enormous spread, which must have been a month's wages, and we were asked to eat it. And of course, if we ate it, those outside got nothing. And if we didn't eat it, we were showing disrespect. I don't know whether you've ever experienced generous hospitality. In some cultures, generous hospitality is really, really important. And it's really important in this account we've had about prayer to help us understand what it's about. In the Middle Eastern culture, hospitality, incredibly important. This is the, this is the situation that Jesus was brought up into so this is the story that he tells it's a story about prayer and making points about prayer it's a story that the people listening would really understand very very well Jesus paints a picture of of someone you know needing some food they've got a visitors come and they need food and in that culture if you had nothing to lay before a guest that was disgraceful 
Now, there's no co-op or NISA to nip around the corner. They're open all hours. They don't exist. So he goes running next door to his friend. Now, this is more than just a neighbor. This isn't someone that you might speak to accidentally when you bump into them on the driveway and talk about the weather. It's not that sort of thing. This is a friend. The word used is phylos, which means a close friend. So he knew his neighbor really, really well. Friend, friend, I need some food. Friend, friend. He used his friend four times, by the way. He goes on about it a bit. Friend, friend, I need some food. And the friend next door says, no. No, can't do that. I'm in bed. The family's in bed. Now, you need to understand, again, what the culture is here. For a poor Israelite family, they lived in a one-roomed house. And in that one room were mum, dad, all the children, the sheep, chickens, the hens, and any other animals. All in one room. And there was about an 18-inch platform that the family slept on, and the animals were down, so they could just be above the animals. So getting children to sleep is quite tricky at times. I'm looking around here for some parents. Yeah, it really is. Once you get them to sleep, you don't want to wake them up again. Getting chickens to sleep is even more difficult, I'm led to believe. So you can imagine it, if the guy gets up, he's got to stumble over children and chickens to get to the door. And the door isn't just bolted, it's bolted and pegged and locked and shut and shuttered and everything. So he says, no way am I getting up, because I'm going to wake up the whole family. We're going to be up half the night. No, thank you. I really need it. I've got to show hospitality. And because of his boldness, because he goes on and on and on about it, eventually the guy gets up and stumbles over the children, stumbles over the chickens, there's lots of clucking and lots of crying, and he gets what he needs. That is the picture that Jesus is painting. This is a humorous story, by the way. The people listening would be smiling all over their faces because Jesus is telling a humorous story. He's been the Peter Kay of his time at this moment. That's how you've got to think of this, to understand what is going on. That's how you've got to think of it. Can we have verse 8? Is that possible? I tell you, they will not get up and give him bread because he's a friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. Despite how close friends they are, that is not the reason the guy gets up and helps out. It's because he goes on about it. It's shameless. Shamelessness. The version that we had was a lovely version, wasn't it? A slightly different word. Shameless audacity is what the version was. That's a great phrase. Just help us understand. That's a very strong word. That boldness. Shamelessness. Shocking. Disgraceful. He kept going on and on and on about it, like I am, to make the point. That is why the guy got up. That is why. Can we go on to verse 9? If we can. There. So we get to the point of the story. So I tell you, the same thing happens when you're asked to pray. Do it again and again and again and again with boldness, with audacity, with shamelessness. That is the comparison that Jesus is painting here. Ask, it'll be given to you. Seek, you'll find it. Knock, and the door will be open to you. Is what he said. That's the point of the story. That is the emphasis that Jesus is painting. He uses these three pairs of words here to do with prayer. The first is an action. The second is a result. Ask, and you'll get it. Seek, and you'll find it. Knock. And it will be opened to you. There's, an, there's, a, there's a sort of an idea and then an action. An action result. That is what Jesus is painting in this. Keep doing it. Do this and keep at it is what he's saying. I don't think these words are, are, are different. I don't think they're just to emphasize the point. It is a story about emphasizing a single point. We are to pray in the same way. Now, I don't know what your prayers are like. Sometimes it's, oh, Lord, you know, whatever your will be done. And, you know, if it's all right with you, can you, you know, would it be okay? Is that how your prayers go? 
Now, whatever you think is fine. It's not what this says. This says shameless audacity, boldness. Is that how we pray? I'm speaking to myself as well, because probably not, if I'm honest. You know, we, we're, we're sort of nice and, well, I'm nice and British about it, you know. Whatever you think is best, and I'll just go with that. That's fine. You know, whatever, whatever you know, sort of thing. We know that God answers prayer in three ways. No, that's an answer. No. Not now, that's an answer. And yes, they're the three answers to prayer that Jesus gives. No, not a good idea, not best for you, no. Not now, because my time is perfect, not yours. Or yes, they're the three answers that God can give to any prayer. We know, you know, there are examples in Scripture, aren't there? Paul, who prays again and again, this thorn in his flesh, please take it away. We don't know if it's a physical thing, if it's a pain in the, you know, behind him, someone who's getting on his nerves. If it's a sin that he keeps committing, we don't know. But he does it again and again and again. And in the end, he says, my grace is sufficient for you, for, my, for your power is made perfect in weakness. The answer there was no. The answer from God to that prayer, despite how many times Paul said it, was no. No, I'm not going to take the, the thorn in your flesh away. But we're asked to pray boldly, confidently, trusting that God has the right answer. And actually, we have another wonderful example, don't we? Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. You know, he's praying away and saying, if there is another way, please reveal it to me now. He knows there isn't. Jesus knows there is no other way. He knows he's going to the cross, but he prays boldly and continuously, Lord, if there is another way, please show me. And God says, there is no other way. No, there is no other way. And then, G then Jesus says, your will be done. Your will be done. And when we pray the Lord's Prayer, and we just heard that Lord's Prayer, you know, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't pray boldly and continuously. Our prayer is earnest and should be earnest Ask, seek, knock, again and again and again. And if we could go on to verse 11, if we could. Because the good news is, God is not going to give us anything that is dangerous for us, even if we go on about it. Some people say, you know, be careful what you ask for, because you might get it. I don't think God does that in prayer doesn't go, okay, you're going on about it. It's not a good idea, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. He doesn't do that. He doesn't do that because that's not a good God. Yeah, go on then, I'll show you. He doesn't do that. And this little bit, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? And it goes on in the next verse. Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. And it goes on. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? We're to ask continuously and boldly, shamelessly, trusting that even if we keep asking for the wrong thing, God's not going to give it to us. But he's going to give us the most precious gift of all. And it's in that verse. The most precious gift of all the Holy Spirit, to those who ask him. I'm going to give his Holy Spirit. We know in throughout lots of scripture, but in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came, came for certain people at certain times, didn't it? Moses, Samuel, David, the prophets. The Holy Spirit came just for a moment or for a specific moment or while they were writing, inspired to write something. There's a wonderful bit that Moses writes. I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. It says in Numbers 11, 29. This says, God's done that. He gives us all the most precious gift of all. And that gift, the Holy Spirit, helps us in our prayers. Helps us to pray continuously. Helps us to know what to pray about. Helps us 
to be wise and actually at times hear the answer no or not yet if that's what God is saying just like it did there for Paul and for Jesus as well the spirit is the father's very best gift to help us in our prayers a gift of himself dwelling within us guiding us leading us inspiring us challenging us changing us transforming us enabling us to be more like the people he wants us to be not just in our prayer life but in other aspects of life as well this is a great little parable a great little story to help us in our prayer life I don't know what your prayer life is like mine is not as good as it should be I think most of us know our prayer life is not as good as it should be do we pray persistently regularly no enough do we go, your will, God, okay, then it's all right? Or do we go pray with boldness, trusting, believing? Do we pray in the power of the Holy Spirit, believing he speaks to us and helps us and guides us and helps us to hear the right answer? I quite like um, surveys and statistics. I know it's a bit sad, but never mind. 85% of people in the UK admit to praying sometimes. 85% of people. That's more people than believe in a God, by the way. So I wonder who they're praying to sometimes. But you know, 85% of people pray to God. And most of those prayers are when they're in a mess. God, help. It's an arrow help prayer. God's gracious. God's good. God answers those prayers because he's good. But actually, what he asks of us really is what Jesus is emphasizing here. He challenges us to pray regularly, to pray persistently, to keep asking, to keep knocking, to keep seeking, to keep going. That's what he asks of us. And to pray trusting that God is good, knowing that God is good. And that God will answer our prayer. And the answer might be no. And it might be not yet. And it might be yes. But he still wants us to ask. And to ask regularly and persistently. I don't think we can be satisfied with who we are and how we pray. Because we all have progress to make in that area. And when we do... We will be changed and transformed because the Holy Spirit dwells within us and is at work within us. He wants us actually to be transformed into those people that God wants us to be. So I encourage you, go home, read this bit of scripture again. We often focus on the first part. I focus on the second part, by the way, today, just to think about that part. Go and read it again reflect upon it reflect upon your own prayer life i reflect upon mine let's speak up let's not be shy let's be expectant let's be joyful and let's be those people that god wants us to be knocking seeking and asking amen